Well, good morning. That was, uh, that was great uh, singing. And how about the young lady by the name of Tessa from our youth group singing? Let's give her a hand. That was, that was awesome. Well, open in your Bibles if you haven't, or certainly pull out your uh, sheet from your bulletin, Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, where we'll uh, be for the majority of our uh, time here uh, this morning. And I, I'm, uh, I'm very, uh, very thankful uh, for God's work. We've been in this uh, very short series on the subject matter of the heart of Christ. And so today is the fourth Sunday out of seven uh, times that we're going to be uh, looking at what do the Scriptures say about the heart of Christ. A couple of weeks ago, I started off with the heart of Christ, and we found out in in Matthew chapter 11, that his heart is gentle and lowly. And what does that mean for us? And then uh, two weeks ago, uh, we looked at the heart of Christ like father, like son. And, and in Exodus 33 and Exodus 34, we, we saw that the glory of God is not primarily or uh, uh, first and foremost his greatness, but it's his goodness, especially as he relates to sinners uh, like you and me. And then uh, last week, Joel preached a message, the heart of Christ for sinners uh, from Luke uh, 15, and how Christ is a friend of uh, sinners and tax collectors, and he eats with them, and he's comfortable around them, and he loves them, and, and uh, he invites them into a, a relationship. Uh, today's uh, uh, part of the heart of Christ is going to be the heart of Christ for sufferers, for sufferers. Now, as your pastor, I fully uh, empathize with the Lakeside family that suffering is a shared experience uh, of the human experience, whether it be suffering physically, uh, emotionally, uh, relationally, uh, financially, trying to cover the areas because it comes in many different uh, flavors, or even spiritually. You can, you can suffer spiritually, and the moment um, that you radically surrender your life to Christ is the moment that your life goes from swimming with the culture to swimming against the culture. And you have this tough balance to keep, you and I do, if you're a follower of Christ, to to be in the world, but to not be of the world. And that creates all kinds of categories of problems. And you realize for the first time how your sin really affects this Christ who died for you. And so, so if you if you got a beating heart and you got blood that's flowing, you're a follower of Christ. Well, then there's when you sin, then there's a following of remorse and guilt, and sometimes even embarrassment. And so suffering can come in all uh, shapes and sizes. And as your pastor, uh, I understand that, that it's across the, the board in our own church. And then as your pastor, I've personally experienced suffering in almost every category there is to physically, emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually. I personally and have given testimony numerous times experienced depression, the deepest, darkest uh, nights and days, anxiety, the highest of anxiety, a brokenness, guilt, remorse, embarrassment over decisions and sin. Just talking about my own life, wayward children, just up in the middle of the night, uh, weeping over you know, God, what are you, what, what are you doing? What do I do? What do I, what have I done? A serious sickness of children, death of loved ones, lostness. So suffering is a part of the human uh, experience. R literally, biblically, when sin uh, entered humanity, suffering exploded on the scene. And I don't think anybody, if you've lived any amount of time whatsoever, has been immune to suffering. Well, we have good news in our text today 
that help has arrived for sufferers. The rescuer is on the scene. Jesus, as we're going to see, sees the need. He feels the need in the very uh, innermost being of who he is, and he's capable and willing uh, to meet the need. And so what I'd like to do is read Hebrews 4, 14, 15, and 16 uh, collectively together. This is where we'll uh, spend our uh, time here this morning. So read it, read it with me uh, if you would. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, verse 16. Hold on here, let me get it up on the screen. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let me pray. Father, we just uh, sang a song uh, led by Josh and Tessa and the group about being still before you to be still and know that you are Lord, that you are a God who undertakes. And so, Lord, today as we gather our thoughts around the blessing of having a God, having a Jesus himself, 100% God, 100% man, fully sympathizing in the midst of our weaknesses, Lord, would you encourage the brokenhearted? Would you challenge those who are cold to you and checked out on life? And uh, Lord, would we be drawn to you? Lord, would you, would you challenge us to have your son's heart, this heart for sufferers and for sinners? And would you do a work in our midst in Christ's precious name? Amen. Now, I want to point out two truths in the first three verses, uh, Hebrews 4, 14, 15, and 16, that are going to be very important when we think about, okay, I'm in the midst of suffering, or I'm headed to suffering, or I'm just coming out of suffering, or suffering is going to be out there more than likely of some uh, uh, size and shape. Uh, What are a couple of truths First of all, that I should know about God, and then I got a really cool little kind of Bible excursion that we're going to go on together. So in Hebrews uh, chapter 4 and verse 14, 15, and 16, I just want to start out by sharing two truths that come out of the passage that, that should be of value to you and you should meditate on, think about, cling to in, in your moment of, of suffering. Uh, it says very clearly in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus is the great high priest. And if you understand what the scripture writer is saying there, this should have infinite value to you when you're down in uh, the valley. He's the, he's the great high priest. In Old Testament Israel, if you and I were alive then, to be able to connect with God We would have to bring an animal sacrifice. We'd have to give it to the priest. The priest then would offer it up to God and speak to God on our behalf. There was no direct access to God. So you either went through a priest or a high priest. Uh, But since Calvary, all that's changed. Now let me me just show you. um, This is the layout of the temple or tabernacle. Just the basic layout. And In the Old Testament, if you understood the priesthood and the high priest, it basically gave the people the visual that you just don't enter into the presence of God, that actually uh, it's a system of of tears of of being barred actually from entering the presence of God. So, So this is a very simplistic version of the layout of the temple. So if you look at the gold on the outside of the yellow, that's called the Gentiles' court. If you were a non Jew, and you wanted to find out about God, you could go to the Gentile court. Now, it was a big place. It was an open place. Uh, The first church in Acts chapter 2 actually met out out in the courtyard. It was was this huge open area. But if you were were a non-Jew, no closer than, than the Gentile's court. If you were a Jewish woman, 
you could go and, and at the very top of the picture is the most holy place. That's where God resided in the Old Testament before Christ. If you were a Jewish woman, you could go to the court of the women. So you could, you could come in through that gate, you'd go to the court of the women, and then there would be, a, be a, a gate that would block you from going any farther. If you were a Jewish man, you could go into the court of the men. You could go a little bit farther, but not very far. And then if you see where the altar is, so then there would be a gate, there would be a warning sign. And then where the altar is, so, so the men would bring the offering, the sacrifice, to the priest. The priest would take it to the altar. So, so if you were in the priesthood, you could go that far. And then to get into the holy place and the most holy place, the high priest would go there once a year. So it was a system of God's presence, but it also portrayed the fact that you're just not going to walk into God's presence and start talking. However, at Calvary... Because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, and Joel will highlight that when you come to our Good Friday service, the veil was ripped in two the moment that he was on the cross, when he died on the cross, and now because of Christ's finished work on the cross, we have direct access to to God the Father. Praise the Lord, Amen? amen? That is like a beautiful thing in the middle of the night when nobody's around and the consequences of life feel like they're, it's never going, the morning's never going to come. Now, I specifically appreciate this because of the Reformation. John Calvin and Martin Luther, in the attempted Reformation of the Catholic Church, which kept an Old Testament system like this, where you had to go through a priest, priest was behind a rail, they had an altar there, and then he would offer up sacrifice. You want to have your sins forgiven? You go, to, you go to the priest, he would take them to God, he would give you some prayers. So everything, everything was through the priest. Well, Calvin and Luther uh, uh, spoke diligently, gave their lives for the fact that no, 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 no. Once Christ died on the cross, we have access to the Father. That system is sinful and shameful. It should be, it should be done, done away with. And two principles came out of the Reformation. The finished work of Christ on the cross. There's no need for sacrifices. There's no need for this special group of people called priests to go to God for you. You because of what Christ did on the cross, go directly to God. And then secondly, and Peter couldn't believe this, he wrote about it in 1 Peter, it's called, if you're a follower of Christ, it's called the priesthood of all believers. Not only do you not have to go through another person to get to God, you are actually a priest, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood, called out by God. You go directly to God. You have the privilege of telling other people about God. You can introduce people to God. And so this idea of Christ being the great high priest has allowed uh, a system of worship where you can go directly to God. Are you thankful for that? I am. He's our great high priest. Number number two, uh, and we'll expound on this, uh, and this is really the heart of the passage of the heart of Christ uh, uh, for, for uh, sufferers. It says very clearly in verse 15 that Jesus sympathizes uh, with your weaknesses in, in your down times. Uh, when you, you don't have your makeup on for, for, for life, like it doesn't look good. Life isn't that great. You're in a valley experience. Maybe it's the circumstances of life. Maybe it's the consequences of a decision. Maybe it's a load that was laid on you that you can't bear. The word sympathize, if you circle that, is made up of, it's a compound word made up of two words. The first word is with, and the second word is suffer. It means one who suffers with. And it has the idea of being a co-sufferer. So, so again, if there was a little a thought bulb that popped up on your head right now, and I looked across, and I could see, okay, well, where are you suffering? Everybody would probably have something that would, would, would pop up. The, the passage is saying that he suffer, he co-suffers with us. It's a felt solidarity with what you're going through in life. What affects you is affecting him. That's what the Scripture's saying, that he's passed through to the heavens, 
But what is going on in your life affects him. He co-suffers with you. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, we'll sing this song at the end of the service. He's a man of sorrows and he's acquainted with grief. Amen? So Jesus knows suffering firsthand. He was tested. He was tempted. He was despised. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was lonely. He was rejected. Falsely accused. He was abandoned. He was scorned. Mocked. Ridiculed. And he was killed. So when he says he sympathizes with you, he is like a doctor. And in raising our five kids, three of them with serious illness, there was nothing, uh, there was nothing more calming to dad's spirit than when we'd walk into a strange doctor's office. Uh, with a cancer surgeon or neurologist or whoever it is, and he would speak to Deb and I about he's experienced the very thing our child's experienced, or he had a family member or a child or a wife. It's like, no, 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 that guy is going to get what I'm going through. That's Christ. I, I'm old enough now where uh, people will occasionally come and and ask for advice on something or whatever, and I'm, and I'm constantly able to say, hey, at 61 years of age, you know, I'm not smarter than you, but I've just traveled down the road farther. I can tell you where to, what exit to get off on. I can tell you where, where the good hot dogs are and where the bad, unclean bathrooms are and that kind of stuff. Like, Christ has traveled the life. That's what, that's what you have to see. He sympathizes with us, not as somebody that's aloof, but somebody that's been there, done that. Now, this has been such a blessing to me this week. When I think about suffering, I think about family, and I think about church family, nothing expresses the heart of Christ uh, more than the tears of Christ, the tears of Christ. And what I would like to do is take a short uh, biblical excursion and follow the tears of Christ in Scripture. Now, Jesus has mentioned weeping three different times in Scripture. And every one of them is very informative. So I want us to go on a short biblical excursion. We won't land long at any one time. But if we want the heart of Christ, then we should want to know what makes Christ weep right? Like, like, what is it that brings him to tears? And, uh, and it, it's going to be of great value. I trust that you'll be as encouraged, uh, that you'll, you'll be filled with a peace, that you can be in his presence no matter where you're at, with a stillness in your heart by following the tears of Christ. So let me give you the three different places where it specifically mentions that Jesus wept. And I'm going to give you a three-word caption that kind of describes what was he, what was he weeping over. So the very first one, uh, the tears of Christ, are where he was weeping over compassion for sufferers. And it's in a passage that we looked at uh, just several months ago in John chapter 11. So the first place that we're introduced to the tears of Christ, Jesus wept, is when he had a compassion for other people who were suffering in life. Now, verse 35, I'm going to read these verses in just a second, but verse 35 is the shortest verse in English, but I can't think of any verse in the Bible that goes deeper into the heart of, our heart of Christ than Jesus wept. So let's just look at it. Let me read it. I'll point out a couple of things. So again, this is Lazarus. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Mary and Martha have just lost, the, other than Christ, the closest person to him in their life. They feel like Jesus has let him down. It's like it's been four days. Jesus, where, where have you been? If you could have been here, this wouldn't have happened. And so, so they have all of these emotions that go with losing a loved one. And so this is what I want you to see. So look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, 
and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved, agitated in his spirit, and he was greatly troubled. He was stirred with his unbelievable emotions. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, after seeing Jesus weep, see how he loved him. So when, when Mary wept, it was a, it's the word that's used for a loud wailing, like overcome with grief and just this heavy sobbing. Everybody in the room would know what's going on. And when, when Jesus saw her weeping and others sobbing, he was deeply moved, greatly troubled, and it says Jesus wept. The word for weeping for Jesus is completely different. It wasn't a loud wailing. This word for weeping, and, and I, I think you can recall the last time this happened with you, it means that you have such an emotional thing going on because of what's going on in life, maybe somebody else's life. The tears well up in your eyes, they overflow and they run down your cheeks. And, it's, and in scripture, it's basically the idea of silent tears. Maybe nobody else even knows. You're, you're, maybe it's over a child, something in your life, something, some, some, something that you've done. It's like where the tears well up. Here's what I want you to see right here in this idea of the heart of Christ for sufferers. Jesus wept for those who were weeping. That's the basic understanding of this. You could read theologians and why did Jesus weep? He, it says very clearly he saw people weeping. He saw somebody who loved weeping and that alone caused him to weep. Now I want you to notice right here, he doesn't correct her, he cries with her. And whenever you see the compassion of Christ in scripture, he doesn't start off with a lecture. He enters into the emotion and he sympathized. Even the woman caught in adultery. He had a heart of compassion for her. She was standing before him naked. He wouldn't lift up his eyes. These rude men were there. He was agitated in his spirit. And only after he had this conversation with her and let, let this woman know how much he loved her did he say, go and sin no more. So the first thing he does in our suffering, even suffering that we ourselves have caused, his first emotion is to weep with us, to sympathize with us, to enter into all of the crud that happens because of what we're going through in life. He doesn't correct her, he cries with her. Now often in scripture, do a Bible study, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Uh, there's numerous times. And I got to thinking this, like, what would it have to be if I was writing about Jesus? What would I see in Jesus that would make me write that he was moved with compassion? What, what would I see in him that I could accurately describe him as having been moved with compassion? Well, there's many places you could go. Let me just give you a couple. In Luke 7 and verse 13, he met a mother who had just lost a son and it says that he was moved with compassion. And he said, do not weep to her. In Matthew 9 and verse 36, he saw this group of people. And he said to the disciples who wanted to get rid of him, tell them to go back home. Tell them they're a bother. Tell them we don't have enough food. It says that he was moved with compassion because they were harassed and they were helpless and they were sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 15 and verse 32, he, say, he says that he was moved with compassion and he said, I'm unwilling to send them away. I'm unwilling to send them back to that lost condition that they were in. When you study the tears of Christ, weeping is more than tears to Christ. It's entering in, it's a solidarity with your weeping. Jesus is humanity's good Samaritan, amen? Amen. He's the good Samaritan. Uh, so, and then secondly, the tears of Christ are next found in Luke 19. And here's what I want you to see. Here's the little phrase I want you to capture. Uh, he, he, he wept over the coldness of people towards salvation. 
He wept over the coldness of people towards salvation. In John 11, he's, he's weeping with friends. In uh, Luke 19, he's weeping over a city and a nation. Let me just read it. This, is, this would be Palm Sunday. This would be the triumphal entry. Here's, what, here's how Luke described it. And when he drew near, the, he's, he's, this is going to be the last week of his life, and he saw the city, he wept over it. Well, wh- why are you weeping over it, Jesus? Saying, would that you, he's talking to the people of the city, the people of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So he's, he's weeping on a day everybody else is rejoicing because he can see what this large group of people are missing out on, and he can see uh, what this large people, group of people are heading towards which is an eternity without him, separated forever, a place called, place called hell, and he wept. I wrote for me, Jesus weeps over sins that I never weep over, and he weeps over people that I haven't wept over or even notice. So think about Christ. He looks at a group like this. He looks at Polk City. He looks at Polk County. He looks at the state of Iowa, the United States, the world. And he weeps over the people who are absolutely cold towards salvation. I've given my life to gospel ministry. I've tried to lay it all out there. I've shared Christ whenever I can. And God said to me this week, Dave, when was the last time, all alone in your little office or your truck, when was the last time that you wept over the coldness of people to salvation? When was the last time? That's the heart of Christ for sufferers. Uh, One one third time it's mentioned that Jesus wept. So he he wept out of uh, compassion for sufferers, out of those who were cold to salvation. And I believe Hebrews 5 and verse 7 is talking about Gethsemane. And he, he... I think he wept over the consequences, the ultimate consequences of sin. Let's, let's read uh, Hebrews 5, 7. Thinking, I think he's writing about Gethsemane. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. So, so number one, if you just look at this verse, and this is Gethsemane, which I think it is, uh, this is his form of praying. His, his form of praying is accompanied with tears. He, he's crying out to the Father. And in the gospel record, when you go back to the gospel record of Gethsemane, it says that Christ was greatly distressed. He was deeply troubled. He's very sorrowful unto death. I said earlier, when sin entered the world, uh, suffering exploded on the scene, and the greatest Uh, the greatest consequence of sin and suffering is separation. Some here have experienced separation in relationships, a brokenness, a a waywardness with somebody that you had been close to, and so you, you understand the pain of separation. But Christ is staring down the barrel in Gethsemane, and feeling the weight of the consequences of sin, and he's looking, I think, when he says the cup, I don't think he's worried about the nails. I think he's worried about being separated from his father who had this tight relationship with all of his life. Starting in Gethsemane, for the very first time, somebody laid a hand on him. That wasn't a hug. That wasn't a friend. And going all the way through Calvary, Jesus assimilated in those few hours all human sin and every emotion that comes with sin. He personally experienced, as he was in the garden and then he went to the cross, 
All the grief that sin brings, all the sorrow that follows sin, all of the pain because of sin, the shame that comes with sin, the entire range of human emotions that becomes of the, that, that's because of the human experience of suffering, in that moment, in those hours, collectively, accumulatively, and growing as he got to the cross, all of that was laid on his shoulders. He... he he experiences everything that the world's experienced because of suffering and sin, and it was laid on him in a few hours. Now, I want you to think about this thought. You follow it through on your own. He was pure. The writer says that he was without sin. Other writers say he was holy and blameless and pure. So starting in Gethsemane and going to the cross... He's got the full weight and all of the ugliness of all of our sin all being laid on him for the very first time. With his purity. And I would make the case that he experienced the raw emotions that we experience to a way greater degree than we could ever experience them. Can you imagine if I raise my kids and uh, we have this environment, mom and dad are always with them, there's always a meal on the table, we tuck them in at bed at night and we, we try to provide for them. They don't get everything, but we, we have this home. And for the very first time, I take my 16-year-old to either New York City or Philadelphia and I show them what homelessness looks like. Can you imagine the shock to their system? Could you, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be graphic here, but, but the purity of a virgin being violated, that's, that's Christ. He's like perfectly pure and all of a sudden the consequences of our sin and the emotion of it and all of the emotion of suffering, it's all being laid on him all at one time. No wonder his method of praying was tears. In sympathy, Christ suffers with us, but in salvation he suffered for us. Praise God, amen? Praise God. Now, need to close, so if you find your way back to Hebrews chapter 4, what do we do as sufferers, fellow sufferers? Well, clearly it's not enough for Pastor Dave to say, when you, you tell me about what you're going through, hey, I'll pray for you. How many have heard that? And then, it, okay, now everybody be honest. How many have heard somebody say, I'll pray for you, and in your mind you're going, yeah, right. How many have said it? meaning it, and then never follow through with it. Okay, so what do we do personally when suffering comes our way? It surely will. If it's not there now, it will arrive as you're raising kids. What do you do? And Hebrews 4 lays out a number of things we can do. Let me simplify it down to three things that I think will be great value to you as suffering comes your way. You're in that valley experience. The first thing found in Hebrews 4 and verse 14 is I would say that you should cling to your profession of faith. It says in verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession of faith. The idea is, is that if you're a genuine follower of Christ, one of the most important things you can do, whether you're a teenager, whether you're, you're uh, in college, whether you're an adult, whether you're a grandpa or whatever, is, is to cling to your profession of faith. Now notice, he doesn't say cling to your salvation. He's got that, amen? amen. John 10, he's double clutching your salvation. You're not gonna lose that. You would if it was up to you, but he's got that. He's saying cling to your expression of your allegiance to my son if you actually have it. You cannot cling to something you don't possess. We go out calling a lot. If you were to stand before God and you were to say, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? And any one of a hundred different things comes out of somebody's mouth. And in my mind, I'm like, if you're clinging to that for eternity, you're gonna hear, depart from me, I never knew you, when you face Christ, amen? So we're talking to cling to a genuine, authentic profession of faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. And he says, if that's you, then here's where you start. You cling to it, you remember it. 
You meditate on it. You thank God for it. What, what is the truth that comes? He's uh, in, if I'm in Christ, there's no condemnation. If I'm in Christ, he sympathizes with me. If I'm in Christ, he will never leave me. Nor for, You see what I'm saying? It, it means to rehearse the gospel to yourself. Like, like you personally cling to it. Remind yourself. Speak. This is your opportunity to be a preacher. Just do it in a mirror to yourself. Like speak it to yourself. Cling to your profession of faith. Number two, verse 15, remember your sinless high priest if you're a follower of Christ. Remember him. Read about him. Meditate on him. Go back and listen to the series on the heart of Christ. Remember him. Let me just share this. He remembers you. Listen to this verse. Write it down. Write the... Memorize it. Quote it to yourself in the middle of the night. Psalm 56 and verse 8. Here's what the psalmist said about God. You have kept count of my tossings. You have put my tears in your bottle. And are they not my tears written in your book? So in the middle of the night, however many nights, he's got it recorded. Praise God, amen? Man, I, I don't think anybody's even cares in the middle of the night. God, where are you in the middle of the night? He puts my tears in, a, in his bottle. He records them in his book. Now let me just ask you something. How near do you have to be to Christ for him to collect your tears in his bottle? How close does he have to be? Because here's what happens in suffering in the middle of the night, whenever it is, when it's the heaviest on us. We think God has left the building. Don't we? Like, God, where are you? God, I've given my life to you. How could this be happening? Actually, if it's physically possible, it's probably not, but I think of it. Christ is actually closer to you in the middle of the night and you're tossing in your tears than he's ever been. And then lastly, and I have to finish with this, you need to pour out your heart to Christ. And there is a huge special blessing in verse 16 with this little phrase, with confidence draw near. If you're an American and you're a follower of Christ, there's a very special blessing. There's a very fascinating word right here for with confidence draw near. You should esteem it. It's the Greek word parishia. With confidence, draw near. Now, let me tell you why you should esteem this verse, this truth, if you're an American Christian. The word first came into civilization, into the Greek vocabulary, about 900 B.C. And the Greeks were one of the first civilizations to develop a form of democracy. And they were thinking, how do we form our government? And some of the main tenets of what the Greeks did in 900 B.C., we've grabbed for American democracy. So let me just give you a couple of things that we grabbed from the Greeks. Uh, number one, uh, your government and the order of, of life in your country should be governed by the rule of law. Okay, well, we can all pray for that today, amen. Uh, they believe there should be a written constitution. Okay, we adopted that. They were the first to believe that every citizen should have the right to vote. We grabbed that. And the fourth thing, and is the thing that I'm pointing to today that the text points to, which was written in the Greek language, is the citizen's right to parousia. And literally, parousia is the Greek word for freedom of speech. So freedom of speech came down into American society originally from the Greeks in 900 B.C., and this is the very word that the Spirit of God used over a thousand years or, or uh, uh, so after to, to say, okay, when you come to this great high priest who has passed through earth and gone into heaven, how do you, how, can you just come boldly? Because you couldn't in the Old Testament, how do you come? The word actually meant in Greek society, freedom of access and freedom of speech. And that is the word that God used and God grabbed to say, if you're a follower of Christ, 
then, then not only should you cling to your profession of faith and remember your great high priest, but you come boldly in, you have access to me, and I want you to lay it all out to me. I wrote in my Bible, I can tell Jesus things I'm not going to tell you. That's what he's saying. I want you to know that one of the tenets of our relationship is that you have freedom to speak to me. Like you lay out your emotions and I will sympathize in your weaknesses. I can tell him things that I can't tell you. Man, what a blessing. Amen? I'm going to close. I got to close. Gone long. I'm going to close with a blessing where the Bible closes. So at the end of a believer's life is going to be an eternity in the presence of the Savior. Isn't that going to be great? The one who sympathized with me is going to meet with me, and look what's going to happen. Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. And look at verse 4. And he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And, and uh, death will, shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning. Neither shall there be any crying. Neither there be any pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Like bring it on, amen? Like bring Bring on. That's if you're a follower of Christ. Praise God that Jesus has a heart for sufferers. Amen? Let's pray. Father, help us for this moment to be still and know that you are God. Lord, even in talking about your son's heart for sinners, I realize that there are a number in our congregation who were raised in an abusive relationship. I just really have a hard time seeing God the Father as loving and gracious and sympathetic. Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would be gentle with them. I pray that they would even repent of those thoughts of your heart pray that you would uh, be a very present help in time of need to them. Lord, you've taken and allowed the Lakeside family collectively, corporately, individually to walk through some very deep waters in the last year or two. Full range of human suffering is on full display. And we thank you for the heart of your son, which is your heart for sufferers, for sinners. We thank you for your son's finished work on the cross. We thank you that you invite us into a relationship. And then in every way, you felt everything that we could possibly experience in this life. And even to a greater degree, you've been there, done that. Lord, would you give us the courage to free ourselves up, to totally give ourselves to you. Lord, would you do a work in our lives for those that know you, Lord, with the heart of your Son, for sufferers and sinners, be our heart to a greater degree. Might we have compassion here at Lakeside for people that are suffering. Might we might we weep over the coldness of loved ones to salvation. Might we be broken over the horrible consequences of sin. Might we find ourselves at the feet of the cross. For those that know you, might we be thankful. Might we be humble. Might we be motivated to tell the next broken person about your great heart for sufferers. I and my family, and on behalf of the Lakeside family, want to say thank you that you were a man of sorrows 
and acquainted with grief. In Christ's precious name, amen.